Okay, welcome to Gospel Backgrounds number seven. This one we're going to be looking at immersion and temptation. So the baptism of Jesus and then immediately following that he is driven into the wilderness um, to be tempted by the enemy. This will be in Matthew 3, uh, 13 through 4, 11 with parallel passages in Mark 1 and then Luke 3 and 4. As always, we have Acts 17, 11 to be our reminder to be like the Bereans, and that is keep an open mind as long as someone is teaching you in good faith, as we are attempting to do here, but always have scripture be the final authority. So Acts 17, 11 says the Bereans received the word with all eagerness, but they examined the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. So they always checked it out against scripture. Fairly short um, uh, topic here. Uh, not that there's any lack of activity, but just in terms of the number of verses, it's a little bit shorter uh, compared to other lessons. So we'll have Jesus baptized by John in the Jordan, and then uh, he is driven into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights of fasting. And there's some interesting parallels there with Moses and then even the nation of Israel who had their 40 uh, days in the case of Moses and 40 years in the case of Israel uh, wandering in the wilderness. And then uh, the temptations. So what we can learn about why Jesus was tempted and then of course his response, which uh, spoiler alert, he always responded with, uh, with scripture. So here's our map from the satellite Bible Atlas of the early ministry of Jesus. And I will go ahead and zoom in so we can see that we are right down along here. Here's the Dead Sea. Um, this is the modern country of Jordan. And then, then crossing the Jordan, we get into the modern country of Israel today. Jordan River here, and then a suggested location of the baptism of Jesus took place uh, not too far from Jericho. And then immediately after that, Jesus is going to be driven into the Judean wilderness here. So um, just for reference, here's Jerusalem. And then... Um, the next lesson we will get into John's version of this baptism and then Jesus will be back up in Galilee to turn water into wine. All right, let's look at Matthew 3 verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. And you can see the Mark and Luke passages are very similar. I've got the uh, the region of Galilee, the river Jordan, and then and in the Mark version, the town of Nazareth in blue to remind us that we can find these places on the map today and we can visit them today. And just as a, a subtle reminder that all of these events we're reading about took place in in real places. They really happened. Um, it's it's just the, the one of the terms for the land of Israel when you go there. It's called the fifth gospel, just because the land is so rich and you can just tie it immediately back to the Bible. So these two pictures are from the same spot on the Jordan River. Um, I can tell you that the top left one was taken in about 1896, and it's actually a colorized version whereas the, the bottom right one is more uh, from modern times, but it's, it's that same curve in the river. So uh, what's the difference you're asking? Well, one, one looks decidedly more impressive than, than, the, than the newer one. Um, the number one issue in that part of the world, really back since ancient times, is water. So if you're ever asked on a pop quiz, uh, your Israeli tour guide asks you, what's the biggest concern uh, here? It's not terrorism, it's not politics, it's water. Um, before 1948, so when this picture was taken up here, the area was sparsely populated. But after 1948, after World War II, we had the founding of both the modern state of Israel, as well as on the other side of the Jordan, we had the, the kingdom of Jordan was uh, technically established at the same time. So with that, the area began to grow and all these new people coming in, well, they needed food and all that food and agriculture required water. And the only stable source of water was the Jordan River. So over time, uh, they began to siphon off water from the river and uh, to water their crops. And it's really as simple as that. So when you visit the baptismal site today, and I've got a picture of this coming up, um, it's not that impressive. It's about 10 feet wide um, <laughs> on a good day. Uh, sometimes it can dry up even, even more than that. So um, basically it's, it's the water uh, rights and, and the agricultural use that has changed the, the landscape, if you will. 
So in our Bibles, it's only been a few verses since John and Jesus met each other back when John was in the womb and did that somersault. But really, uh, this is 30 years later. So John and Jesus had probably never met until this day. But um, John apparently recognized Jesus as soon as they saw each other. We'll look at the Gospel of John, John chapter 1, next lesson, and that will develop that relationship a little bit more. Also by now, um, there's no mention of Joseph, uh, Jesus' supposed father or, or stepfather or whatever you want to call him. Um, so the thought is that he's died and G then Jesus as the firstborn would have been left in charge of Mary and Jesus' siblings. So um, he might not have had the chance to tour around with the rabbi like his disciples are going to tour around with him for several years. So, um, But even with that said, we know he's he was very well versed in scripture. He held his own at the discussion at the temple when he was 12 and we presume that he's been reading in synagogue and um, you know teaching perhaps uh, as, as he got older as well. Um, verse 14, you know, you see John the Baptist saying, whoa, this is backwards. You know, I need to be baptized by you. Um, Lancaster paraphrases that is, I need, I, John, need to be baptized by you, Jesus, with the Holy Spirit, yet you come to be baptized by me with water. Um, and so kind of that, that was his John's kind of astonishment there. Um, of course, Jesus himself did not need to be baptized for his sins. Um, Craig Keener in his commentary notes that Jesus' response indicates his identification with Israel in obedience to the law and by extension, larger humanity. And of course, we all did need purification. So to fulfill all righteousness means it's the proper way of doing things in the proper order. A prophet in the spirit and power of Elijah was supposed to arise, identify, declare, and anoint the Messiah. And that's what's going on here. So when, when Jesus is saying um, we need to do this to fulfill all righteousness, it is not just the act of Im immersion in the water and coming up. It is the whole scene with John the Baptist preparing the way, John the Baptist anointing um, the Messiah. So um, conversely, being baptized by John meant that Jesus was testifying to the authenticity and authority of John's message. So there was kind of a double, uh, double verification going on here. So this picture was taken in February 2013. The water was extremely high after a prolonged drought, but usually you can see it's not that wide. Uh, and if you follow these handrails down, uh, and then that's that's the country of Jordan right there. So it's it's not not very wide. This is the traditional location of um, of Jesus's baptism. That is my friend, Pastor Doctor Dan Solvarger, and there I am right there, um, being a good Talmud, hopefully that day. Um, but yeah, I, I love going to Israel with Dan. He's just he's so rich of uh, stories and uh, and background, and he really loves the land. He loves the Lord. Um, so thank you, Dan, for all you've poured into me. Um, Jesus is called my beloved son. The commentaries note that this could also be read my son, the beloved, or even my son whom I love. And then that recalls Genesis 22. Abraham is told, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering. And tradition holds that where Abraham was about to offer Isaac is the location of the temple, uh, the Jewish temple, and then is today where the Dome of the Rock is. Isaac, uh, back to the, the beloved, Isaac then is a type or a foreshadow of Jesus who actually would be sacrificed in Jerusalem. And thus Lancaster notes in apostolic theology, the beloved one becomes a title for the Messiah. This is that same area. And I got a picture of a couple of doves and I don't know if they put these here just for the tourists or what, but um, it was kind of cool to see at, at Jesus' baptism site to be reminded of the doves. Craig Keener says in his commentary that in that day, many believed the spirit of God had gone silent. So the fact that we have the heavens opening and the spirit poured out really was a signal that the messianic era had arrived. It is really the stamp of approval on Jesus as the Messiah. All right, let's look at the first temptation, Matthew 4. Then Jesus was led up to the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. You can see the Mark passage skips all of the detail and it just, it has the spirit driving Jesus into the wilderness and then uh, he was 40 days and then he was tempted 
and then uh, the end will say angels ministered to him. Luke is uh, has the exact same uh, stories, except that the second and third temptations are flipped. So um, we'll, we'll look at that as we get to it. Here's a picture of the Judean wilderness. Of course, we don't know exactly where Jesus was led and where the temptation happened, but uh, a lot of this land looks like this. It's very desolate, very uh, hilly, and not a lot of good passageways and all that. Jesus was led into the wilderness just as the nation of Israel was led into the wilderness. Uh, two different wilderness, but uh, remember after the exodus from Egypt, they, uh, the nation was taken into the wilderness where they had to learn to rely on God and uh, trust on God and then learn to follow his, follow his statutes. Um, and then also it's noted that Moses fasted for 40 days and 40 nights just as Jesus did. So this 40-day um, this fast of Jesus recalls both, um, uh, uh, both Moses and Israel. So God sustained them all. Uh, and then Jesus passed the test, whereas the other two uh, failed at, at, at some level along the way. So some Christian traditions observe Lent, which is where we abstain from certain pleasures uh, and maybe do a partial fast for 40 days, uh, the 40 days that, that are between Ash Wednesday and the Resurrection Sunday. And we do this in honor of the 40 days in the wilderness. It's interesting to note that um, Jewish people also observe 40 days of Teshuvah, which is 40 days of repentance, which recalls also the wandering in the wilderness. So perhaps we're not as far apart as, uh, as we may think we are. Um, their 40 days concludes with Yom Kippur, which is the day of atonement, which is a day of national fasting. Uh, Lancaster notes, Jewish litur liturgy treats the day of atonement as a day for dealing with Satan and his accusations. The liturgies of the day are filled with references to a legal showdown between Israel and the devil, which concludes with the scapegoat being led out into the wilderness, symbolizing, uh, symbolizing sorry, the defeat of evil. So a direct parallel to what Jesus experienced um, to what, the, what Yom Kippur represents today. This photograph was taken in the Judean wilderness along the ascent of Ad Mumim, Ad Adumim, can never pronounce that, um, between Jericho and Jerusalem. And it's that, that is that steep 18 mile ascent, but it goes up, you know, 2,500 feet or so. Um, Lancaster comments that if you are the son of God, uh, he, he reads that as a taunt. Scholars debate on, on when Jesus came into his full realization of his destiny and his mission and all that. Many scholars speculated it was would have been at his baptism when the spirit descended on him. So if that's the case, then um, this may have been an attempt by Satan to force Jesus to question the revelation he just received. So it's kind of like if you've seen the movie where some normal person is given some superhuman ability, um, they, you know, they need to try it out. They want to see if this is really true. And so maybe Jesus, um, Satan thought Jesus might have been susceptible to something like this. All of these temptations really involve shortcuts to revealing his messianic identity and his plan. Remember that the phrase that Jesus uses frequently really between now and the triumphal entry is my hour has not yet come. He says that over and over again. Yet here with, with each of these temptations, Satan is offering Jesus uh, a shortcut to um, have it happen immediately. So the first temptation is, the, is Jesus declaring that he trusts the revelation that he heard come from the mouth of the Lord. He did not need to prove it. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Note that we've uh, skipped a passage in Luke because Luke has the second temptation of uh, being at the temple. Luke has that in third in his series. So leaping from a tall building is not normally a temptation to anyone. So let's <laughs> let's take a look at the um, at what else might be going on here. Um, Keener notes that the valley below the, was uh, much steeper 2,000 years ago than it is today. Um, but even so, the the drop is likely deadly. So it's uh, we, we aren't sure whether this is a vision or whether they were supernaturally transported to Jerusalem from the wilderness. Lancaster tends to believe it's the latter. Um, they also aren't really sure on whether the, uh, the location is this corner of the Temple Mount, which we're looking at here, versus the actual top of the temple itself. Um, there's a some ambiguity in the Greek word uh, 
terugion, and that has a connotation of wing, so we, we don't exactly know what that means. We also see here that the devil is an expert at handling scripture. So uh, he's, he's telling Jesus that God promises to send his Psalm 91 angels. He makes a direct reference to that. However, a righteous one, which in Hebrew would be known as a tzaddik, T-Z-A-D-I-Q, if you want to uh, transliterate that, um, Jesus would have known that angelic protection is for ills that, uh, you know, that befall God's servants, not for those who seek out danger and, and, and tempt him. So this is why we must know our Bibles, because the enemies around us, whether it's the enemy with the capital E, whom we call the Satan or the enemy, or cults or even people trying to twist things around they can they can trip us up if we don't know our bible so this is why we're going through this series in the gospels verse by verse and uh, we're going to know this this section of scripture very well lancaster makes an interesting comment that the sages understood deuteronomy 6 verse 16 which jesus is quoting to mean that no one should ask a prophet for a sign and this reminded me of Jesus' words in Matthew 12 and also um, in Matthew 16 that a wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign. But then it pinches a little bit because oftentimes in our prayers, we ask for a sign or we ask for some confirmation. Um, I think that's good. I think the risk is you may get the sign and you know, was that really the sign or God sent me another sign? You you're, start being like Gideon where you're asking over and over again for the same thing. Um, my preference is God. I'm going to be a, a dumb sheep. If that gate is open and I want to go through it, I'm going to go through it. So please be my shepherd and close any gates you do not want me to go through. So uh, I, I try not to ask for signs, although it's, it's interesting. Um, even when I don't ask, sometimes uh, sometimes God just provides a sign and it's kind of neat when that happens too. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to them, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only uh, shall you serve. Then the devil left and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Luke adds an interesting note. And when the devil had ended the temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. We presume or we infer that that opportune time is going to happen at the Garden of Gethsemane. Where, uh, where, where the devil comes back um, with a vengeance, if you will. It is interesting to note that Jesus says, be gone, and Satan has to obey. Uh, that's that's good news. So the, the Jesus and Satan are not opposite sides. They're not yin and yang. You know, Jesus is the, the creator, and Satan is a created being. So they're not equal in that sense. We don't really know what mountain, uh, which, which is the high mountain we, we've like to think it's Mount Hermon, uh, which is in the far north of Israel because it's the tallest mountain really in the area, um, but uh, we don't know for sure. Satan shifted here from, from questioning Jesus' credentials, and now he, he really offers a direct shortcut to the kingdom. Um, Lancaster compares this to Moses standing on Mount Nebo, surveying the Holy Land uh, and, and all of its you know future greatness um, and you know, all this could have been Moses if he if he didn't trip up. And then Satan's offering that to Jesus here. The greatest empire of that day would have been the Roman Empire. And so this is a picture of Rome today, um, the, the Forum and the Colosseum area. There are some startling implications here, um, which Chuck Missler got into in some of his teachings. Missler asked, rhetorically, he, he said, if I offered to sell you the Brooklyn Bridge, are you tempted to buy it? And the answer is no, because you're fairly confident I don't own it. So for this to be a temptation where Satan is offering Jesus all the kingdoms of the world that belong to, to him and he can give them to whoever he wants, um, that is not a temptation unless Satan can back that up. So Jesus doesn't challenge his ownership, which should give us chills you know this is a world clearly run by satan and uh he's a usurper to be sure but uh satan in does in fact own all the kingdoms of this world and their glory so um for the moment anyway satan uh sin and death all have dominion over mankind and those are some of the things that uh you know got out of whack in the fall uh and jesus needs to, to put that right um, and we'll, we'll see that be put right at the end, end of the story. And we can read about that in Revelation. 
So again, uh, Keener points out that Satan was offering Jesus a shortcut, um, offer him to be the conquering military messiah that most people in that day were expecting. Apparently, even the devil didn't see it coming that the Jesus was going to be the suffering messiah who would also uh, raise from the dead. So um, even apparently, even Satan was expecting Jesus to be a military messiah, and here he was offering him a shortcut. Mark alone here notes that Jesus was with wild animals during his temptation, um, the point being that he was really completely isolated without human contact. Um, this is the uh, picture of the ibex or the rock goat, um, which is common in the Judean wilderness, and we can see those at En Gedi. En Gedi is a really cool place. We need to go there. Um, it was where uh, David penned a lot of the Psalms, and this, it's this oasis in the middle of this uh, desert-like wilderness. Um, Lancaster notes that wild animals, and the Greek word there is therion, could be actually rendered as living creatures, which in Hebrew is chayot. Um, not, not coyote, but chayot, meaning uh, chai means life, chai means life. Um, and uh, that invokes to me an entirely different picture. So Ezekiel saw the vision of four living creatures, sometimes called the, the angels of fire, carrying the throne of God. So imagine Jesus not being attended to by, by wild wildlife, <laughs> but um, perhaps by the living creatures that uh, we will see uh, in the book of Revelation again. This has been a fairly quick run through of this passage here. Um, if you are interested in more background, there is the following the Messiah that actually covers these exact same um, events, the baptism and the temptation. It's episode three, and um, you can see the link here, and I'll put the link again in the video description as well. So we have these three tests, and then uh, we notice rather conspicuously that Jesus answered every temptation with scripture. And in fact, they're all from the same section of scripture, Deuteronomy 6.13, Deuteronomy 6.16, and Deuteronomy 8.3. This passage is where Moses is recounting uh, the, 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 the story of the Exodus. And so these are commands God gave to Israel in the wilderness. So whereas the nation of Israel failed, the Messiah of Israel passed all these three tests. We can obviously rejoice that Jesus did not give in to sin. So again and again, this is uh, this is where he says this is to fulfill all righteousness. His whole life is to fulfill all righteousness, and, and we need to, to praise him for that. Hebrews, uh, you can see the verse on the screen. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet he is without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. So Jesus, 100% God, he can handle everything. He can live a sinless life, but he's 100% man in that he can take our place and live that perfectly righteous life um, on our behalf and then impute that righteousness to us. So there, uh, just in closing, there are three things I think we can learn about Satan. There's probably more, but one, uh, and, and these are largely from uh, Jeremy DeHutt in, in the Following the Messiah video. Satan is an opportunist, right? He waited for Jesus to be in a weakened state. So uh, the, those times where we're prayered up and we're ready for the battle are probably not when Satan's going to attack us. He's probably going to attack us when we're weak. Um, we heard a a teacher a few weeks ago who was a, like a traveling minister and uh, he was just exhausted and alone in his hotel room and you know I'll, I'll let you fill in the blanks of what happened next and that led to you know ultimately his divorce and his life crashing down upon him so it is that when we're weak is when we need to be very cautious and, and really have our our uh, our guard up that uh, we, an attack could be coming Satan number two Satan had more than one tool in his tool bag um, he, he approached Jesus from three different uh, perspectives. Uh, he will use multiple tactics and multiple attempts to try and get us to fall. And of course, uh, the, the obvious one, he's a liar, right? He, he may know, know scripture very well, but he will twist it around and he will tell you a half truth. Um, yes, it is true that God will send his Psalm 91 angels, but no, it is not true that uh, he, 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 won't, he won't necessarily send them if, if you tempt God and, and, and put God to the test as, as Satan was asking him to do. So uh, to very, be very cautious of someone who you know, seems to be spinning a good tale, but you just have some uneasiness about the tale they're spinning. 
So application here, um, how would how would I have responded? You know, picture yourself that day by the river. Uh, how would I have responded to seeing the Holy Spirit descend and hearing Kol Hashem, hearing God's voice, proclaim Jesus as his beloved son? So what would that have done? Um, that certainly would be a game changer, and I just don't want us to get lost on that because it's such a familiar story. But really, it's, it's really extraordinary that, um, that after 400 plus years of, of silence, that God would come down and, and uh, proclaim like this. So... I, I noted in going through this that fulfilling all righteousness was not just Jesus going under the water and coming back up again. His whole life was fulfilling all righteousness. Um, he fulfilled the righteousness that we couldn't do uh, by ourselves. So we need to thank Jesus for that. So how long has it been since, since we've thanked Jesus? Maybe just pause the video or audio right here and, and just say, Jesus, thank you for for all that you did um the the more we study each detail the more we uh, are appreciative of everything that you've done that we could not do and then a little alliteration here jesus met temptation with torah um so how do i meet temptation the world today wants to tell us that anything goes there's no truth um but yet jesus and the torah affirm that there is right and wrong and our our judicial system today comes from the ultimately the ten commandments and and the you know judeo-christian uh heritage that comes from the five books of moses so uh just some thoughts here as we close out the the next lesson again we'll switch over to john and we'll be in john for the next few lessons um where we'll, we'll start in the wilderness again we'll kind of circle back on that story um john, it's interesting that john omits the actual baptism but he talks about some things around it and then we'll work our way up to cana for the miracle of turning water into wine so we will see you on the next video